Hey man, what a great song. <laughs> I, I think it's funny though. Do you think they intentionally wrote lisping, stammering tongue there so that way you would actually trip over those words? I swear, that is like, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy to sing that verse for me because I feel like I have a lisping, stammering tongue every time I try to sing that verse. Uh, I just love it. I love the hymns. They're so full of the richness of God's Word and good theology, most of them. <laughs> and so we uh, just really appreciate it. If you have your copy of the Scriptures, turn with me to Acts chapter 11 as we finish up this chapter this morning, moving right along in the book of Acts, which is written for us according to Luke, which is his sequel to his gospel that he wrote. We've been going through the book of Acts for quite a while now. We actually went through Luke first. For those of you who have been here a long time, you've been a part of that. And so we're continuing on. So this is sort of like the continuation of Jesus's ministry as he has now sent his people out, his church, which is the body of Christ, to go into all of the world so that all might believe the gospel and be redeemed be saved. And so we see this continuing mission of Christ given to us through the Great Commission and also um, illustrated, or I guess outlined in the first chapter of the of Acts, which is where Jesus says to remain in Jerusalem um, until the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And what we're going to see from here on out the focus of the vast majority of what we have left in the book of Acts is dedicated to the gospel going to the uttermost parts of the earth. What we're going to see today is a church that was started um, that is not inside the Israel area. It's a, it's a church that started that's way outside in the Roman Empire. It's about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It's along the, the Mediterranean Sea and it's in a complete pagan area and we're going to see how this church was started here um, for the express purpose of being the launch point for the gospel to continue to go throughout all of the Roman Empire and this happened because of an unlikely uh, reason what we're going to see as we get through this passage of scripture that it began out of persecution and so stand with me this morning as we read God's holy word together in Acts chapter 11 our passage for this morning verses 19 through 30 from Acts chapter 11. It says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking to, to uh, the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was upon them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord." So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined every one according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. This is God's word revealed to us, given to us by the pen of Luke, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Please receive this as it is the word of God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless the proclamation of your word. We pray that your word would go out and would not re return into you void, Lord, but would accomplish all that is intended to accomplish, Lord. We pray that the Holy Spirit would move in our midst this morning as the proclamation of your word is, is made. May he convict us of sin 
and of righteousness and of judgment as we hear your word. May he guide us into all truth and may we exalt Jesus Christ our Lord to the glory of God the Father. We pray that you would bless our time and bless your word and I pray that we would all walk out of this place changed. For those who have not yet come to faith in Christ, may they hear the word of the Lord and be changed. May they be transformed and redeemed and rescued from your wrath through sal and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Give us ears to hear. Give us minds to understand. Give us hearts to, to receive the word this morning. Give me the words that you would have me to speak. And when you're finished, close my mouth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we see here, as we continue on this passage of, of Scripture from Acts chapter 11, that this is actually a continuation of sort of something that happened before a big gigantic parenthesis happened that gives us more information about things leading up to this point in time. Now, it's not really a parenthesis, but it is kind of an interesting way that Luke set up his, his book here, that as we get to this place now... We're getting to what happened after the stoning of Stephen. Remember, if we go back to Acts chapter um, 8 particularly, it says in the first couple of verses of Acts chapter 8 that Saul approved of his execution, that his is Stephen. And so he approves of Stephen's execution and that there arose that day a great persecution among the church in Jerusalem. So, and that they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria area except the apostles devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him but Paul or excuse me Saul was ravaging the church and entered house after house um, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So this happened many years before this. But the idea is that Luke is now picking up that thought that happened at that time. And what he picked up is what happened after that. And sort of a meanwhile, over here in Antioch, this is what's happening because of the persecution that occurred. And I had one of our readers read this morning from Genesis chapter 50, which I think is so appropriate with this particular passage of scripture, thinking about how the the um, brothers of Joseph took Joseph and they hated him because he was exalted amongst all of his brothers uh, because his father had preferred him over his brothers and because he's dreaming dreams about how all of his brothers and his parents are eventually going to bow down before him and so there's probably some pride that went along with Joseph and he probably had it coming to a certain extent maybe not as bad as he got it but he he was probably being a little bit you know pr puffed up about that himself anyway but his brothers were so angry about this that they decided to take him out and kill him. Well, they didn't. one brother stood up and said, no, we shouldn't kill him. So they threw him into a pit and they waited for, they saw some, uh, I think it was Edomite traders. Is that right? And they came and they sold Joseph into slavery who took him down. I'm sorry. Ishmaelite, thank you. I knew it was it was related to the Jewish nation, but I couldn't remember how it was. The Ishmaelite traders, and they came and they took Joseph and they sold him into slavery in Egypt. And, through, and, and then Joseph, who had dreams of being lofty and high and lifted up, and all of his brothers, he found himself, um, after having been falsely accused of sexual immorality, arrested, thrown into a jail, into a dungeon. And here he is, sitting for literally years in the dungeon of an Egyptian prison, right? And so here he is, and after having all of these dreams of being high and exalted and all those things, well, you know the story. He was, uh, uh, um, started to interpret dreams for Pharaoh and he was exalted and then he interpreted more things and he was exalted to the place where he by the end of his life was second in command of the entire Egyptian nation and God used all of this why to preserve his people the whole point of all of it the whole point of all of it was so that he would preserve the nation that he had appointed to bring about the Messiah. And we see this happening all throughout the Old Testament, how God just continues to preserve his people for the express purpose of bringing about the Messiah, that Jesus would come through that. And so we see that happening. But in that passage that we read earlier, we saw that these people meant it for evil. In other words, your brothers, the brothers of Joseph, meant it for evil against Joseph. Joseph. 
But God in his sovereignty, God in his authority over all of this, and because of the preservation of his people, took what they what meant for evil and he meant it for good. And by doing this, he preserved the entire nation according to the promise that he gave to, his, to the fathers and in order to bring about the nation of Israel and the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so, and so that's what we see right here, don't we? We see the same sort of thing happening which is a great reminder of how we ought to be faithfully trusting the Lord and his plans, even when it looks like his plans might be failing, even when it looks like the whole world is against us, even if it feels like we're literally 70 people out of the entire world only living for the Lord and the entire world is going against him to understand that he is faithful and he will even use the wicked and evil plans of godless people to bring about his plan and his purpose. Do you understand that we have been called to be faithful even if we are fighting against the entire rest of the world? Even if even if the rest of the world includes a lot of the supposed church, we need to remain faithful to him and to his words. Because often whenever wicked things happen, when evil things happen, when difficult times occur, we have no idea how God may be using these difficult times to bring about the next step in his plan of redemption. You see, God is sovereign. He's sovereign over the world. He's sovereign over redemption. He's sovereign over his church. He's sovereign even over the circumstances that you are feeling or experiencing right now. Some of us in here are experiencing great joy and great happiness and a wonderful time in which we're walking with the Lord. And praise God for that. Some of us are going through very difficult times and deep times of despair, depression, or difficulty that we may be experiencing right now. But in all of these cases, in all of these cases, we know according to uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, since we are his people, he is working all of these things for good and for the good of, uh, of, of his people according to his plan according to his purpose and so so we saw that those who were scattered uh, this is the same word scattered here that we use to describe diaspora that's the word that's the greek word they were diaspora all over the place because of the persecution this also tells me sometimes as people of god as the church of god we've been called to hold up and stay faithful where we are Sometimes it's okay to depart. You see what I mean? If it gets really, really bad and we, there's no shame in being scattered if that's what God has planned for you to do. And there's no shame in saying, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to hole up. And if I die, I die. You know, it, 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 the point is, is that God uses those people who remained in, in Jerusalem. That's what it said in, in Acts chapter eight, right? The apostles stayed there and they continued to minister where they were. But then a lot of the church was scattered all over the place. But like we talked about when we went through that time, when they tried to stamp on that fire to put out those coals, all it did was spread to the coals to the surrounding leaves and they lit the whole forest on fire, you see? What they tried to stamp out, what they didn't know is they ended up spreading all over the place. It's like when you're trying to clean black mold in a house and you try to hit it with like some bleach and stuff and you're trying to kill it but what you don't know is that you're spreading those spores all over the place and then it takes over the entire house now let's remember that in the affirmative right and the other way the other side of that is they were scattered but because of the persecution that they experienced because of the scattering that happened they now became a whole army of evangelists for Jesus Christ and as they were doing that they went over um, as far as it says to Phoenicia, to Cyprus, and Antioch. It says, some were speaking the word to no one except Jews, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also preaching the Lord Jesus. So here we have these people going about preaching the Lord Jesus. Now what's happening here? Um, if we, Cyprus is an island that's out in the Mediterranean Sea. It's off the coast of Turkey, um, kind of south of Greece. If you're thinking about it, if I were looking at it this way, it'd be like, here's, here's the Mediterranean 
or uh, Asia Minor and, and Syria and all that, and then the islands over here. So it's out there. So they're going off to an island nation there. We also see that Phoenicia is like that, that in-between place. It's between um, the border of Jerusalem and going up into Antioch. That's the Phoenician area. And then we have Alexander, or excuse me, I'm thinking of the other one. Um, What's it? Antioch, thank you. Antioch is up there along the coastland, um, up sort of north of Syria, up in that area close to Asia Minor. But it's a completely pagan area. In fact, it is the third largest Roman city of, of the Roman Empire at this particular time. Number one, of course, being Rome. Number two, being Alexandria. But number three is Antioch. Rome is known for its power. That's where the power and the authority of Rome comes in. Alexandria is known for his wisdom. That's where the great library was that burned and we lost so much of what we could have known. Uh, but, it, but Alexandria is known for its wisdom. Antioch is known for its business, and it's also known for its immorality. Antioch was like Corinth on steroids. It was a place where there was concentrated evil, which makes a lot of sense, right? One of the things that I love that Bill shared a while back um, that I thought was really profound is this idea of what he calls the Tower of Babel syndrome, okay? <laughs> that where people are concentrated in great places, people who are sinful are concentrated in these places. Those places become exceedingly sinful. That's why places like Los Angeles and New York and Chicago are so full of reprobate wickedness and committing so much crime and murder and sin and all this dirty works going on. Why? Well, because there's a whole concentration of evil people that live there all together, uh, sort of like concentrating that evil. And I thought that that's very interesting and profound. And we see that here. Antioch is the third largest city, uh, multiple uh, hundreds of thousands of people within this city. It's a gigantic city during a time when they didn't have high rises and stuff. And so it was known for its, uh, um, what do you call it, the, the, how they worship the, their various pagan deities, their gods and goddesses through cult prostitution, um, through all sorts of sexual immorality. It is just known for being an absolutely godless, reprobate place. And you know what happened there? God used it to establish his church. Even in the midst of this incredibly pagan, incredibly wicked, incredibly godless place, he is there building his church, you see. I remember whenever I was in seminary back in 2004 to 2007, there was a guy um, in... Um, uh, uh, Dr. Pittman was, was pastor of a church, a big church in the Memphis area. His son, Vance, went out to Los Angeles, or sorry, not Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and he started to plant a church there. And everybody thought he was nuts. They were like, Las Vegas, that city full of prostitution and gambling and reprobation. And he said, and that, ch that church, it planted and bam, shot up real fast. Because those people out in Los Angeles, I keep saying that, Las Vegas, are so sick and tired of being sick and tired, you see. They were so f done with, I chased the drugs and it led me nowhere. And I chased the prostitutes and it led me nowhere. And I chased the gambling and, and now I'm broke. And see, they had, they've tried everything that this world has to offer, but they didn't try Christ. And then they came with the gospel of Jesus Christ and people began to come to faith in Christ left and right they just they were baptizing multiple people every single service because they're just seeing this outpouring of people why because in this godless area when they go to the prostitutes and they say boy that felt good for a moment but boy I'm just so empty still and now I kind of feel even more empty now than before I did that you see and they're so lost that they're end of their rope they have everything given to them they're fulfilling every worldly pleasure and they just still leaves them empty and then someone comes along with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and they hear the gospel and suddenly they are convicted of their sins but more than that they hear the hope of redemption the hope of forgiveness the truth is proclaimed and they believe it and then they're changed you see because they looked for the truth here but they couldn't find it and they looked for the truth over there and they couldn't find it 
And so when the gospel came along and they were ready because they were at the end of the rope, they understood and they found salvation. The church blew up. It grew like wildfire in the midst of this reprobate city. And I think about the application for us here and now where we are. We live in a crazy, godless, pagan, reprobate nation now. We are murdering our children by the millions every year. We are committing, we've, we've forgotten what a man is, or what, a fe- what a woman is. We have, I'm thankful to call this Mother's Day. This is Mother's Day. All of you mothers, so good to have you here this morning. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my mother, right? You know, uh, they're not chest feeders. I mean, good night. Can you think of a more wicked thing? Birthers, yeah, birthing persons. Oh my gosh, my my soul just I uh, I can't I can't even I can't put it into words how it makes me feel when people would dishonor the high calling of mothers in such a way. But that's the world we live in, folks. That's the nation that we find ourselves in right now. But you know what the good news is? It's not going to last. It's not going to last. You can't prop up this level in, of insanity and it lasts for any period of time. It's going to collapse under its own weight because you can't go down this far and it lead to anything lasting. People are already who, it's horrible. It's a horrible thing. It's a terrible thing. These people who have gone into these mutilation centers where they have removed perfectly functional and beautiful and wonderful parts of their anatomy that God gave them because they were created to be a man or a woman and have gone through it and they've disfigured themselves and they've made themselves disgusting, who after doing it, understand now after all of it that it it didn't satisfy. It didn't fulfill the longings that they were looking for. And they're even now beginning to understand how horrible it is and how, how this does not lead to anything lasting or permanent. Where does the church need to be for those people? Ready to share the love of Christ with them. Ready to share the good news with them. To say that, no, you haven't found it in what you were looking for but I know where you can find it. I know where you can experience the truth. I know where you can find the lasting fulfillment that comes the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. That when they come to the end of their rope, we shouldn't be there scoffing at them and telling, I told you so, or anything like that. We need to be ready saying, I once was searching too. I once was going this way and this way and this way and all of the world left me empty and all of the world left me wanting and all of the world left me more and more disgusted with myself. But Jesus Christ changed my life and I have found uh, salvation through him. We need to be ready with that gospel message and I think that's what we see happening here. That even though they're in the midst of this incredibly godless, reprobate, pagan city the church is exploding because they are going with the gospel of jesus christ so they're going and one group's preaching to only jews but it says that the other ones are preaching to the hellenists as well now this was kind of weird to me i didn't know what they meant here by hellenists do they mean that those people they only spoke to jewish like hebrew speaking jews as opposed to greek speaking jews but i don't think that's what it's actually talking about here i think what luke is saying is that as the church is going up there we're starting to see that the gospel is being preached not just to the Jews but to all the nations you see they're being the the gospel is being proclaimed to all the nations so now some of these very same people who are burning incense to Zeus or going into this cult prostitute or something like that are now repenting of those things and coming to faith in Jesus Christ so the church is growing and it's a mixed multitude of church in fact I think that's the reason why Luke positions three <laughs> 
retellings of the same story about how, no, the Gentiles are in, the nations are coming in, that, that Romans and people outside of the camp of Israel are coming in, and the, God, or the Holy Spirit's coming upon him, is to show that this is gearing up for, now we're focused on, we're seeing the nations come into the church now. And so we see that now the gospel's not just being proclaimed to Jews only, but it's also being proclaimed to those outside of the Jewish nation, to all the nations that are in the area. So we see that happening here. In verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. What a wonderful testimony. I'll tell you what, a great number of people turned to the Lord happened because of what? Because of the hand of the Lord that was on them. It's a picture of how God used that and in his sovereignty is bringing people out. God has promised. He said, go out and get them. Why? Because there's them to go out and get. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the reason why we have hope and we share the gospel and we know that people are going to be saved is because he said so. In fact, I think more and more people are being saved the more that we go out. I think in the last like hundred years of more people have been saved than like the previous several hundred years before that. Why? Because we have things like the internet and we have missions going out to all parts of the world and we see these people coming to faith in Christ left and right. And so it's a wonderful thing to know that when we go out to share the gospel, yep, a lot of people are going to spit in our faces. A lot of people are going to scoff at us. A lot of people are going to say, no, thank you. But then some of those people are going to repent and believe. Why? Because God's sovereign in salvation. He said, I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to save. I'm going to elect people to salvation. So we get the wonderful privilege of joining in on the work that he is doing with his hand to be faithful to experience the salvation that he's bringing to people. You know, there's nothing like leading a person to Christ. Boy, there's just nothing like it. I, I, I have had lots of experience going into the inner cities of, of a couple of different cities and, and seeing a lot of people come to faith in Christ. And it's just, there's just nothing like it in the world. You should experience it. So be faithful to go do it because, because he said they're out there. I remember we're going to see a little bit later as they go into Corinth that God's going to say to Paul, he's going to say, I've got many people in the city. He already knew their names. He already knew where they were. He said, you go get them now, you see? And that's what he's saying to us as well, that we are to join in on the work that he is doing. The good news is, is that we can't frustrate the plans that God's gonna do. So get faithful and get in on it and experience the joy and the blessing and the reward that comes through sharing the gospel with other people. So the hand of the Lord was on them. A great number believed turning, uh, and turned to the Lord. And the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So it's going so well <laughs> up in Antioch. And there's word now spreading throughout everywhere. And the news is getting all the way down to Jerusalem. So what does the church that is seeing a great number of people coming to faith in Christ need? They need help. <laughs> they need help. What did Jesus say? You know, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send more workers in the harvest. Bill and I love serving as elders of this church, but we're praying that God would bring more leadership here so that way we can serve the church better um, here. We want this to happen. We need this to happen. We'd love to see this church continue to grow. We'd love to see it happen. But what we're going to need, we're going to need help. We're going to need more people. And so well, they sent their encourager up to Antioch. Remember, Remember, Barnabas is only his nickname, <laughs> that his actual name is Joseph. And Barnabas just means in the Aramaic, son of encouragement. Why? He's such an encouragement. He's a son of encouragement. He's like, he's like, you know, he's the offspring of encouragement. That guy is just so encouraging. So he goes and he's a leader and he's an encourager and he's sent up there to go help with the mission that's happening in Antioch. There are, I remember when we were planting trying to plant <laughs> Family Life Church up in St. Louis, one of the big issues that we had is we just could not get anybody in to help us. I mean, we, we knocked on thousands of doors throughout all of, all of the uh, city and the area there, and we did block parties, we, 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 we did, you know, trunk or treats, we did stuff, we did all sorts of things to try to reach out to the community and win people to the gospel of Jesus, you know, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we just had no help. 
And it wasn't for lack of looking. <laughs> we asked people, hey, can you come with us? Hey, can you come with us? Here's a work that we think God wants us to do in this area, but we just couldn't find any help. And we just sort of collapsed under our own weight because we just had no help. We couldn't do it anymore. We couldn't sustain it. So find the area where you fit in and get to work. <laughs> Be part of the help that's necessary. I was thankful. I was just talking to my brother earlier today and he about a way that he can help out in the church and he was happy to do it. And I'm like, praise the Lord. Something that I don't have to have in the back of my mind anymore to remember to do. We need help. Find where you can help and get in on what God's doing, okay? Um, but we need, you know, leadership is so important and help in the midst of that. Workers for the harvest. And so they send Barnabas up as a worker of the harvest. And when he came, he saw the grace of God and was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. What do you think it looks like to see the grace of God? I, I was listening to a guy as part of my study, and he was talking about that. And I, I, it didn't even hit me until I was listening to that. That's an interesting point. That's a real good question. What does it look like to like when he got there? He just he knew it. He saw it. He saw. Yep, this church is experiencing the grace of God. What does that look like? You know, what does the grace of God look like in a church? Well, I think first and foremost, I think what it means is that all the people are excited to come and worship the Lord. That there's this hunger, this love for God, that we are excited to come together to lift high the name of Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father through the Holy Spirit that we have come together. Our focus, our mindset, our desire is not coming in to say, hey, what can this church do for me? It's, no, I've come here to worship the Lord. And that only comes by the grace of God. Because naturally, we don't have that desire. Naturally, we like to be self-centered. Naturally, like I like my comfort. I like my ways. But when we come together and we're not focused on, oh, poor me, and how come you haven't done this to me? And how come you didn't visit me in the hospital? And things like that, you know? It's, but we, no, and not that, you know what I'm trying to say. The point that I want to come visit you in the hospital, I really do. But what I'm saying is that the express purpose of why we gather is to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. And that's our focus. And we're not worried about the little, you know, problems that we have. Our focus is on the glory of God and the worship of Jesus Christ. So I think that is one manifestation of the grace of God. I think the other manifestation of the grace of God is a, a lifestyle of repentance that we see in the life of the people. That, that my life looks different because I've experienced God's grace. And so my desire is to follow after him. So that, that includes repentance. We, we find that people are repenting from sin. We find that people are confessing their sins to one another. People are, are, are engaged in this wonderful fellowship within the body of Christ. I think that's what the grace of God looks like there. And I think that that's what he's seeing here. These people, they've, they're, not, they're not burning incense to Zeus anymore. They're worshiping the Lord. They're, they're repenting of their sin. They're not going into the cult prostitutes anymore. They're repenting of their sin, you see? The Jewish people, are, are they're, 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 they're experiencing the grace of God too. They're not looking to the letter of the law anymore. They understand that their salvation is in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. So we see that this proper teaching, this proper doxology, this proper repentance, all of these things are manifestations of the grace of God. And I think it's great that it was so evident amongst the church at Antioch that Barnabas goes there and he sees it. He's like, you guys got it. You guys got it. Oh, that that would be true of Reformed Bible Church. I'm preaching to myself here, folks. I want to be that. I want to be consumed with the glory of God and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I want to be, I want to walk in repentance that pleases my Lord. I want to be a church that's so open and honest and transparent with one another and, and so not given to things like uh, uh, tail bearing or slander or things like that, that we feel safe and comfortable to be able to confess our sins to one another, realizing that there's no one in this congregation right now that is not in some way, sin or another, you see what I mean? And so we need to confess that before God and before one another. 
That people would suddenly, those secret sins that have been in the back closet for so long, you now feel uh, uh, comfortable enough to be able to come forward and open with that and confess your sins to somebody and repent of it and no longer be shackled, you know, by that sin that's still there, you see? But to find freedom in Christ through confession and repentance of sin. What a wonderful thing to experience tangibly the grace of God being manifested in a congregation and how he went in there and he saw that. And so what does he do? Keep on keeping on. He exhorts them. He encourages them, that son of encouragement, okay? He encourages them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. So what does he say? He doesn't come up with some new teaching. He doesn't come up with some new thing. He says, you guys are doing great. Don't turn away from this. <laughs> Stay still steadfast stay on the straight and narrow path that's what he's saying remember the gospel keep preaching the gospel keep living the gospel keep repenting keep exhorting keep glorifying the lord keep on there's no special things there's no special bells and whistles there's no secret knowledge it's just the ordinary means of grace that's what the christian life is okay remaining faithful in the areas where he's called us gathering together to worship the Lord, uh, a prayer, reading the scriptures, Lord's Supper, you know, being involved in each other's lives, encouraging one another, lifting up one another, bearing one another's burdens, living this out. Keep doing that. The things that are already just clearly laid out without the gimmicks, without the programs, without the bells and whistles, just the ordinary means of grace that God uses to make us more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You see? That's what he's called us to do. And it's the same thing that Barnabas says here. All right. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So continue in that, and that's what happened. So notice the faithfulness is where that happened. The faithfulness is where that happened. That's really important, I think. That it's good to do evangelistic campaigns and things like that. You know, I love Billy Graham's, you know, whenever he would do his crusades and stuff. Those are great. Those are wonderful things. But I think that church growth happens far more through ordinary people doing ordinary things and ordinary faithfulness with gospel intentionality. Just continuing to live that life for Christ and rubbing elbows with your workmates, your family members, your neighbors, things like that, as you have opportunity to live out the gospel of Christ before them and share the gospel of Christ with them through that ordinary, everyday faithfulness, okay? Mothers, mothers, let me exhort you, especially those of you with little children, your primary mission field, your primary uh, uh, role is to raise those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and teach them to love Jesus. Fathers, same. <laughs> same. Same thing, okay? That, that we need to be sharing the gospel with other people too. But don't lose your children in the midst of that. Remember that your primary mission field, as your primary focus, is that those little kids would love Jesus and follow him and that you would train them to do so. Okay? Now, I said primary. That doesn't say only, but it is primary, you see. So if you have opportunity to share with other people, but don't think that, that just because you're in the daily grind doesn't mean that you're not having eternal significant impact. You see what I mean? You are. You are. So, so just, just praise the Lord and be faithful in that because you are. And, and understand that that is how God is doing things like adding people to the Lord, you see. That's how he's multiplying believers. <laughs> So Barnabas, because he himself also needs help, <laughs> he goes to Tarsus to find Saul. Now that's interesting here is whenever it's look for Saul, this is like this is like an intense, like laser focused searching out for Saul. He's like, I need Saul. He's understanding it. And why? Because I think the Holy Spirit's leading him in this direction because we're going to see later on that through Antioch is where now the modern, or modern, but the modern to them at that time, uh, the, the missionary movement would take off is through Antioch. And so, so he needs Saul because I think God is directing him to find Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, 
They met with the church and taught a great many people. So not only do we see evangelism happening here in this church, but we're seeing discipleship happen in this church. Evangelism does not end with somebody praying a prayer. Okay? Evangelism does not end with somebody just repenting and saying, Jesus is Lord. Evangelism continues as we continue to disciple people in the faith of Jesus Christ and to continue to walk in that. In a sense, the Great Commission doesn't say make converts, does it? The command does not say go into all the world and make converts. No. The Bible says, Jesus says, who, by the way, I said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples. That's what he's called, disciples. Baptize them, and then he says what? Teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. And so that's what we see happening here, that Barnabas and Saul are now, all of these new people, all these people added in, they got to be trained up, they got to be taught, they got to be discipled in the faith. So then they stood there a whole year teaching and training those disciples. You and I have been called to continue to walk in discipleship. That's why we continue to gather, to exhort one another, to continue our walk in discipleship, to continue our walk in understanding the scriptures, to teach one another in all of these things. And that's what we see happening here. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. It's the only time that this word is used in the scriptures, I think. At least this is the first time I know here, for sure. <laughs> but the idea here is that an eon, I-A-N, uh, at the end of a Latin word, means like a, of the group of. That's what it kind of means. So uh, Caesareans, okay, that means they're of the group of Caesar. Christians, what they're saying is, oh, that's those people who are of the group of Christ, that's what it's saying. And so they're known as Christians. And often it's been understood, and I think it's true, that this was once considered a pejorative term. Oh, look at him there. He's trying to be like Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. And so when the world yells at us and screams at us and starts to make fun of us and mock us and calls us all these names, oh, you guys just want to be like Jesus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's really the point. That's exactly what I want to do is I want to be like Jesus. But it's so evident by their lives. It's so evident by their proclamation that everyone around them, they saw that they were Christians, you see? Do you have the air of being a follower of Jesus Christ in your life? So that we, when you walk around and you are seen by other people, they know you are a Christian. Do they know? Because they knew here. Don't think that the world that you're walking in is any more antagonistic to Christ or any more pagan than the world that these people are walking in. It's not. They hated them then. They'll hate us now. But do people know? We ought not to be ashamed, and we ought to stand strong for Christ so that people, even if it's a pejorative thing, they look at us and they see that we emanate Christ in our lives. Okay? It's not going to be the last time. The Puritans, Puritan was once a pejorative term. Oh, you're just trying to be a Puritan there, trying to purify the church. Yep, that's right. <laughs> you better believe I am. So wear the badge, okay? Wear it if it's, you know, appropriate, but wear the badge. Understand that, that that's a good thing. If the world starts mocking you for following Christ, you're doing something right <laughs> because the world hates Christ and it's going to hate us because of it. Jesus said that, okay? So just remember that. All right, last little bit. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. So even though they went north, they went down because Jerusalem's on a hill and Antioch was not. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So this is an inter, this is the apost apostolic age. There's still a lot of prophecies and things like that happening during this time, and that's why we see this happening. So here's this guy named Agabus who's making a prophecy during this time that's happening. And I think it's very interesting how this whole passage really feels a lot like that Genesis passage, doesn't it? What's happening? Well, there's a famine. And what's going to happen through the famine? God's going to be glorified. And so we see the same thing, even from the beginning, where it says that the persecution was meant to stamp out the church, but what they meant for evil, God meant for good. And look how he uses the 
famine here. Isn't that awesome? I just love those little things that just remind us that this is one book, <laughs> Genesis to Revelation. It's one book. It's all the word of God. Read the Old Testament. It's awesome. Okay. It's so good. One book. So anyway, there's a famine in the world. What does that do? There's two reactions. Oh no, there's going to be a famine. What are we going to do? There's, or there's, there's going to be a famine. So let's see how we can glorify God in the midst of this and provide for his people. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, uh, I remember somebody I used to know, um, he called it not a problem, but an opportunity for something. I can't remember how he said it, but he always looked at it. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity for growth or something like that. You know, it's an opportunity. And that's how they looked at this. And that's how I think we can too. Look, the world is getting very dark and difficult around us. And I think that if you pay any attention to any economics at all, it's got to drop sometime. You see, you can't just print money forever and ever and ever without it. Just We may be experiencing some very difficult times. How are we going to react? Oh, no. Hold up. Be scared. Oh, no. Or here's an opportunity for the church to go in and help. Here's an opportunity where we can collect some money or maybe this is, we're coming into a time. Praise God, we've got a lot of chicken folks in here. Like there's a lot of people in this church that keep chickens. There might be an opportunity coming up someday where your eggs are not just gonna feed your family but some other families in the church as well. I don't know, I'm not, a, I'm not doomed sane or anything like that here. I'm not being anything except for see how God may be positioning us in such a way that instead of us freaking out about things that may happen, to see how, well, how can we be faithful in the midst of this? How can Jesus be glorified in this? How can we use this as an opportunity to share the gospel with more people that they might come to faith in Jesus Christ? Because God uses famines and persecutions and all of these things throughout all of history to accomplish these purposes. Are we immune to that? I don't think so. I don't think so. So if God ends up using persecution in the near future, or economic collapse in the near future, or famines in the near future, or anything like that, maybe we won't. Maybe we'll, our, our whole time will be relatively peaceful and not much problem. Who knows? God's sovereign, you know? <laughs> He's sovereign. But what I'm saying is this, is that here's a famine, and what do they do? So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So what did they do? With this famine, they didn't think to themselves, oh boy, I better hold up and be scared. No, they said, how can we use this as an opportunity for ministry? How can we use this as an opportunity to reach out and love the people? Isn't this interesting? Here's this newer church. What are they doing? They're raising money to send back to Judea. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? That God grew them to the point where God then allowed them to go support somebody who had been there for a long time before them, possibly, you know? Before it spread there, it was spreading in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, right? And so it's just amazing how God does stuff like this. I'm so thankful that we're a new church plant helping to support a new church plant that's meeting up in Vermont. Praise the Lord for that. I don't say that with any sort of pride or anything like that. I say that to say, look at how God has blessed us and through us has blessed them. You know what I mean? It's like, how can we look for that? How, how is it that now China is sending more missionaries to the United States than we're sending to China? You know, I don't know if that number is actually true, but I know that a lot of missionaries are coming from China to the United States to come share the gospel with, with Americans. Whoa, what happened? Well, what a wonderful privilege. What a wonderful testimony that they would be faithful in the midst of that. And so I look at this in this church in Antioch, what a wonderful picture of how we ought to be as a church and how God, even in the midst of, of what began in persecution and continued through famine, became a church greatly used by God. And in fact, we're going to see that this isn't even the half of what they're doing. This is just the beginning of how Antioch is going to end up becoming the major church in the entire Roman Empire that becomes the missionary sending church to the rest of the world. What a wonderful privilege. What a wonderful thing. May God give us a piece of this according to his mercy, according to his grace. Let's pray.
We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the wonderful testimony that we see of the Church of Antioch and how you used what came out of a difficult and dire circumstance through persecution, through, through living in, a, in an area that was utterly pagan, and through a famine, Lord, to bring about a great number of people that followed after you and how you displayed faithfulness and how you displayed repentance and you saw people coming from different backgrounds and, and nations and ethnicities and all these things coming together in this one church proclaiming and displaying the glory of God. Father, I pray the same for Reformed Bible Church. I pray the same thing, Lord, that we would be a faithful church, that we would, people would come in here and they say, boy, I see the grace of God here. Father, I pray for us individually, Lord, that, that in order to accomplish that goal as a church, we all individually must be walking in a manner of repentance before you, Lord, and faithfulness in our walk with you, glorifying you. Give us grace to do so, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that as we talked about in the beginning of this message, thinking about all of the people who tried everything that the world had to offer, paganism and prostitution and drug abuse and all these things that they were experiencing in Antioch, Lord. Maybe those same people or kinds of people are experiencing that here today, and they've looked everywhere for, for fulfillment. They've looked everywhere for salvation, but they've not found it anywhere else. May they find it in Jesus today. May they repent and trust Christ, and may their lives be changed through Jesus Christ. Now we pray that you would fellowship with us this morning as we eat at your table. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.